personally indebted to Burma because when my parents were first married, they first settled in Yangon. And they must have had such a great time there because I was conceived there. So if it weren't for Burma, I wouldn't be here today. So I'm very pleased for Burma. You know, one of the things that had been discussed earlier was that one of the possibly, one of the few possibly positive outcomes of uh, China-US tensions were, was that with more companies moving out of China, certain countries are not seeing the benefit. And Vietnam certainly has been named as a beneficiary. I think certain, some, quite a number of companies have wrapped up their investments in Vietnam. Logically speaking, you would think Myanmar should also be a great beneficiary. It's, its wage levels are even lower than that of Vietnam, but it doesn't seem that Myanmar has attracted as much investment coming, potentially coming out of China as Vietnam has. So my first question to you would be, sir, what might be the primary obstacle to more FDI in Burma itself? Uh, thank you very much for this uh, very interesting question. Because I think, first, the absence, I think there is an absence of logic. Let me put it that way. As you say, logic is speaking. Uh, people should be flocking to Myanmar. Like geese looking for a place to land, uh, we have the environment where they can land and they can prosper. So I think uh, these uh, industries that are moving out of China and elsewhere uh, are looking for a landing place. They're looking for greener pastures. And Myanmar indeed is a very green pasture. So uh, we have set up the new Ministry of, of Invest, Investment and Foreign Economic Relations, of which uh, I have the honor to lead. And this is a reflection of our desire to make sure that uh, we uh, present the world with a more uh, friendly environment so that people can seek us out and come and invest in Myanmar. And here in this room are represented many of the companies uh, that are uh, either uh, already in Myanmar or are looking to come to Myanmar. So I'm happy to receive you and, and explain to you how it works. We now have a one-stop shop uh, system, so you'll be surprised to see how easy it is to set up a sh shop in Myanmar. Since you're also a national security advisor, and you've said I could ask this question, I think many people, particularly our European friends from around the world, uh, would, we would all have noticed that for some time, uh, Myanmar was, and Dawn Aung San Suu Kyi was lionized around the world, and today she is virtually demonized, and there are even people talking about removing taking back the Nobel Peace Prize from her, and so on. So in a short period of time, Myanmar, which was the darling of investors from around the world, suddenly has become the no-go place, the pariah. And that's largely because of problems in the kind state, and Rohingyas, and so on. In your position, both having to tackle invest, inbound investments and as national security advisor, what is your take on this dilemma? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think uh, uh, I should address the elephant in the room. So everybody's thinking about the Rakhine issue. Let me stress that Rakhine is a very complex issue. It is an issue that we inherited from historical times and more recently from colonial times. But it is an issue that we need to address without adding on emotion to it. It's, it has now become a very emotive issue. People do not understand the situation in Rakhine. First of all, Rakhine is a state of about 3 million people. Uh, it is one of 40 states in Myanmar, and it is a very complex state, because in Rakhine, the majority of the people living there are Rakhines. They are more than 2 million people out of 3 million people. There are other smaller ethnic groups, Moro, Dainan, uh, Kaman, who are Muslims, and even uh, Hindus, a group of Hindus who are living there. So we need to see why the situation developed the way it did. First of all, in August of 2017, uh, on the 29th of the 24th, uh, there was a simultaneous attack of 30 security officers. People tend to forget that if you have 
a planned attack on security outposts, we are bound to have a response from the security side. And so it happened that when the security forces were attacked, they responded. And after that, uh, there was uh, an exodus uh, to Bangladesh. But we recognize that in order to resolve this problem, Bangladesh and Myanmar are the two principal that are needed to get together to find a resolution. We have been trying to uh, have a dialogue with our friends and neighbors uh, in Bangladesh, and we agreed in uh, November of 2017, we had an MOU sign to uh, proceed with the repatriation. The fact that it has not happened is because uh, there are people with different agendas in the camps on the refugee side, uh, in Cox's Bazaar. Uh, there are ASA, the terrorist group operating there, and they will not allow people to leave these camps. So, for example, the, uh, there are 440 plus Hindus who have uh, expressed the desire to come back through the Indian embassy. They have, been, they have not been allowed to leave. So, how do we proceed? Uh, in a situation where fear rules the day. Uh, the reason for this is that they have instilled fear in the hearts and minds of this group of people living there. And they have insisted that these people be given automatic citizenship. No sovereign country in Asia or elsewhere in the world will give you automatic citizenship. If you do not have documents, you can apply to become a citizen and you will have the possibility to uh, go through the process and you have every citizen will have his rights and responsibilities. And in places like Singapore, you are required to do military service. In the constitution in Rima also there is a requirement to do military service. Uh, we may or we may not enforce it, that depends. But uh, the point is that if you want to be part of a country, uh, you, you have to make, uh, to go through a process. It's not automatic. And if you say you will not come back because uh, you uh, want to have an automatic citizenship, then it's, it's going to take a much, much longer time. Uh, I'd like to stress that as a national security advisor, my first duty is to ensure that there's peace and stability in the entire country for every member of, of the nation and every citizen. Are there any, I don't have any questions on the, on the iPad, but if there are people who have any questions I'd like to raise, please, please do raise your hands. I, while waiting for people to have any questions, I have to say that I, I and many of my other ASEAN colleagues might not be so deterred from investing in, in, in Myanmar simply because of the Rakhine issue. However, we faced other problems, including my own companies, and that has been the bureaucracy in Burma, the fact that we've been dealing largely with military officials who have a military background or with politicians. And I, I have to say to all my friends in the audience today that has been really refreshing for me to discuss with the minister today. Some of you may not know that his background is as a foreign service officer who then, a senior foreign service uh, officer who then retired, came to Singapore and worked for a few years with ISIS, uh, and then also worked for Shell. Um, and so he has a completely private sector mentality towards the investment issues in Burma, which is refreshing because other times many of us who have tried to do business in Burma have encountered endless red tape and officials who basically have a military background. So despite your credentials as National Security Advisor, which probably comes from your diplomatic service and so on, it has been extremely refreshing. So. I would encourage anybody here who's got specific projects in mind. I've introduced ministers to some of my friends here who've got a lot of interest in Burma uh, and have been frustrated to directly talk to you. And they've got essentially an open door to, to talk to you, to visit you in Yangon, and to see what can be done with investments in Burma, which are clearly needed by Burma and also at the same time very advantageous. Uh, to individual companies. Any any questions from anyone at all or comments you'd like to make, whether it be diplomatic, 
political, economic? I used to tell my colleagues in the cabinet that uh, life was easier in the uh, private sector, and it surely is because uh, uh, in, in the private sector there's less stress, uh, and of course, I'm sure the remuneration is better. <laughs> if I were to ask you, um, you, you painted a picture of how open Burma is now to, to foreign investment, and I think we certainly can be quite convinced of that. You've also given some good figures about the growth rate of Burma and so on. If I were to ask you to choose two or three particular sectors that you would, you would highlight and encourage us to consider investments in, uh, I, I assume natural resources obviously would be one of them. Uh, what are some of the others? Uh, actually, I would uh, uh, defer on the natural resources because I think that that would require that we do it in a careful manner because uh, the extractive industries, while providing us with the much needed funds, uh, is a complex uh, industry because uh, now that we've opened up, we have a lot of concerns uh, by our citizens on the environment, issues of environment, climate change, etc. So in that matter, it takes much longer uh, to uh, have discussions and then to go forward on that. But what you might want to consider are two areas which can uh, be uh, turned around very easily. The first is agro-based industries. Uh, we are an agricultural country. 70% uh, of our people live in the rural areas. We are still a community of nation of farmers. So uh, if you are interested to uh, invest in, the, in the agriculture, livestock and fisheries, uh, you would be most welcome. I'll be happy to facilitate your entry. As I said, we already have a project bank where we put out the priorities and we also have a land bank where we can match uh, the land that is needed for your projects. So the first area that I would like you to, to encourage you to come and invest is in the um, agricultural livestock area in the rural areas. And we also provide you with uh, incentives, uh, seven years tax holiday if you are uh, uh, investing in the less developed areas of the country. Our second area is tourism. Myanmar is one of the most beautiful countries in this part of the world, if not uh, in, uh, compared to other regions. Uh, if you just take a look at the uh, archipelago that is adjacent to Thailand, the Miek Archipelago, or uh, we call it Big Archipelago, but uh, there are 800 pristine islands. So if you want to go back to nature, uh, that is the place to go. Uh, the coral reefs are among the best in the world. And so those who want to invest, like the Banyan Group, Banyan Tree Group, I would be most happy to have you. You've let the cat out of the bag. I was going to actually have be the first to set up a project in <laughs> Mogoi Archipelago, which is world famous, and now you've told everybody else they should go. <laughs> I have no first mover advantage anymore. So we, we have a few questions from other people, if I could ask. Well, one of them is, with the various challenges that Myanmar faces, what are youth sentiments towards the future of Myanmar, and how are the leaders of Myanmar preparing for the next generation of leaders? Well, this government is only three years old, and uh, it came into office in uh, 2016, but uh, previously uh, the country had been closed for more than half a century, and so uh, it's difficult for this government to undo everything in this short period of time. Rome was not built in a day, so we are working on it. So in order to do that, we have first had to bring on board uh, the older generation of bureaucrats and and, and government officials, senior government officials, uh, to bridge the, the human resource gap. But we are training our new generation to take over. In fact, uh, very recently we have appointed, made some ministerial appointments at the deputy instance level to, uh, to open the door to younger generation, and so that they will be able to take over in, in the coming years. So this is the way we are uh, proceeding. We are also placing a lot of uh, store in our investment for education. We believe that education is the best investment we can make. 
So we are sending a lot of scholars abroad to different countries. Uh, we have allowed investment in the education sector. So if uh, Singapore companies and other universities, uh, institutes are interested to invest in the education sector, they would be more than welcome. So because we believe that uh, the, the best investment is it's investment in education. The, the, in fact, the questions are not coming in fast and furious, but we are supposed to wrap up. So can I just read out to you two questions, which are not entirely related, and perhaps you'd like to answer them in one, or choose whichever one you'd like to answer. And the first one is that ASEAN placed, played a nuanced role in Myanmar's international engagement, both as a buffer and as a friendly observer, throughout the last two decades. What do you think is the most helpful contribution that ASEAN can make? For ASEAN, for Myanmar's ongoing development. That's the first question. And the second one is Myanmar is at the same time being courted by China, India, and Japan, and how can you handle so many suitors at the same time? Well, you know, uh, pretty ladies get uh, all, all the suitors. So we, we are now getting the suitors, but uh, we want to be friends with everybody. And as I said earlier, we want responsible investors. So as long as investors are responsible and uh, are there uh, for the long run, and we'd be happy to receive them. Uh, with regard to what ASEAN can do is that uh, we have opened up, and we can learn from the experience of our neighbors who are doing very well, Singapore and others. So we do not need to reinvent the wheel. We can learn from the experience of our neighbors. Uh, ASEAN, in fact, is the fastest growing uh, group of countries in the world. So we can latch on to ASEAN and work together with us. We want to be connected to the world, and ASEAN provides us, provides us with a gateway to the world. So we are happy to do that. We would like to uh, ensure that the gap between uh, different groups in ASEAN is closed. Uh, we want to see the connectivity uh, improved. Uh, I can tell you that uh, we are working very hard to be connected. For example, just a few years ago in Myanmar, uh, there were very few uh, handheld devices, uh, telephones. Uh, it would cost $2,000 for a SIM card. Today, the SIM card is available for one US dollar. And everybody has a one or two cell phones, in fact. So uh, we're trying to catch up very fast. We want to be connected and we we'll work together with ASEAN to grow together and be connected to the world. And with regard to China, we have a long border with China, 2,000 plus kilometers. Uh, we have 1,500 kilometers border with India. And we are strategically located between the two fastest growing economies in the world. So we uh, would like to work together with them and would like to see Myanmar as a, a venue for cooperation. It doesn't have to be a venue for competition. So we would like to welcome India, China, Japan, and all the rest of you. Thank you, sir. I think in wrapping up, all I'd like to say is that for myself personally, for many years, and I think many of my friends in the room would share the same sentiment, we have long been admirers of Dr. Aung San Suu Kyi when she was in opposition and in quite a lot of serious trouble. And she was a beacon of light for people in Burma and for many people around the world. And now that she and her party are in power and Myanmar really needs foreign investment, and it's exemplified by people like yourself who have given a lot in order to serve the country, I think it probably behooves many of us to see how we can help. And certainly, I think many of us in ASEAN in the room today would find the opportunity to contact you personally afterwards and to see in what ways we can help Burma uh, really become a prosperous country while at the same time benefiting our own companies. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yes, yes.